Well, right, really. Well, I'm in what was the cardboard house. We've got insulation panels around the sides of a lot of it. And polycarbonate, complete with a roof. It's actually a gable roof, that's the main beam that everything's screwed into. And you can see a little line there, another one there. It's the uh, ridge capping. And there is the odd hole. And I'm basically laying on the bed. We've got a mattress on this and uh, bought a whole new set of sheets with a new pillowcase about a week ago. Anyway, I want to talk about uh, <laughs> some characters who just don't seem to get it. Just in life with general social interactions and stuff like that. Now we all know uh, our good friend Short Bus. He's uh, definitely one of them. And I couldn't work out why Mike Livenfree suddenly turned against him. And um, <sighs> this lacks a little bit of ventilation in here at times. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping to get these ones behind me that I was just showing and make it so I could lift those up and uh, get a bit more airflow through. Um, and of course, I've only recently had a shower, so I'm sort of uh, still a bit warm from that. Um, anyway, long and short of it is, you know, you couldn't work out why Gerald turned on him, Coates turned on him, couldn't work out why Mike Living Free turned on him, you know, and here he's talking about growing the channel, growing the channel, I'm getting more people, that means more money, more people, that means not only more AdSense, but more donations, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, and all he's doing is growing his amount of trolls. You know, they watch him for a week and don't say much and then realise what sort of person he is. And, uh, you know, maybe search his name or just see other videos coming up as recommended views and... I work out who they're dealing with, and must admit he's gone from you know seventeen hundred people to two thousand people fairly quick, and uh, you know it's uh, strangely enough, there's a little video I've got that I don't know how the fuck this happened. There's a hundred and twenty thousand views on this one fucking video I've got. I don't know how this shit happens. You sit there working, working, working at your main channel, and then. You re-upload a little dash cam video you saw on another channel and all of a sudden, you know, 5,400 views within a week. Then I'm looking at like 36,000. Now it's like fucking 120,000. What the fuck is going on? How do you fucking get viral like that? Anyway, I probably should be doing something with annotations on that video to direct people to go to better videos I have. Anyway, I'm not that intrigued about YouTube anymore, but uh, it's good to have a little platform just to talk about stuff. But I'm going to tell you a story that I probably shouldn't be telling you about a guy at work and uh, <laughs> come along, you know, all this talk of uh, all these big money jobs he's had and blah, blah, and you know, within the first week, he's real happy towards me, all good and everything like that. And, you know, he was sort of assigned as yet another one of my sidekicks. And uh, <laughs> he told me in the first week that uh, it's the first job he's had in three years. And then told me he's been to jail for debt collecting. Ah. Uh, then on his eighth day working there, he decided that he knew better than me and uh, twice in about 10 minutes he had to upstage me and, and the second time he he reckoned he was boss pretty much and I realised that the argument we're having, the fact that I, you know, may or may not have been right didn't matter. 
it was just that he was number one and I was number two. And this is how he is within a week and a half of being there. His eighth day on the job. You could not make this up. Except it did actually happen. But I mean, you know, there's a lot of things with the old uh, short bus you couldn't make up, but they do happen. Anyway, getting to the point. This guy ended up getting uh, about the three-week mark. They said to him, look, we're going to... Um, you know, they, they plan to put him with someone else. So this someone else come up there and uh, mm, someone having trouble with the car gears and um, come up to him and said on the third week of this guy being employed that uh, you know, uh, well, it looks like you're going to be working with me. This guy who said this to him has been there for oh, a few months now, you know, at least five months or something, and uh, <laughs> he's actually a more valued part of the company than I am, even though I've been there almost a year, and uh, because he's very good at what he does. And this idiot who's been there for three weeks turns around and says to him, oh... That's all right, but I got a way that I like to do things, and and so you we you know you're going to have to do it my way, dude. You've been there three weeks. You are not going to be the boss of another guy who's been there for five months. No fucking way. You will be working under that guy, not the other way around. Well, it didn't end there. He turned out he was uh, in a in a church, and it was a little bit like teabag being in a church. It was one of them sort of churches, and uh, <laughs> well, I'd seen this guy lie on his eighth day there, and uh, lie plenty of times since. But uh, he got into the habit of asking other employees if they'd ever lied as a kid. And if they had, then he'd tell them they're going to hell. Okay. All right, then. <laughs> nice to know you're fitting into the company well at about your, you know, fourth week here. Um, yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> a little bit more on the, the church. Turned out they're a bit of... Um, well, doomsday Armageddonist, uh, you know, there's going to be a war that ends the world and who knows exactly when, but it could be a year away, it could be two and a half years away and blah, blah, and so he's going to Israel in July and that's going to, you know, prepare him so that uh, he's going to be, uh, you know, one of the ones that gets saved and, oh, yes, on top of that, his church is the only one, his church is the only church that's going to have the survivors of this great war. <laughs> so, you know, some of the other churches, well, they're not 100%, so they're just going to either go to hell or get shot to bits, you know, because his church is the magical one that's the only one that's going to be saved from this great big bloody war that's happening and, and all this stuff. And, uh, yeah, well, then we sort of went from there and... Uh, before you knew it, he started to get a bit demanding about what jobs he wanted to do, and he didn't want to do some jobs, and he did want to do other jobs, and and was one job he just wanted to do, just pretty much that one job. And uh, one day we're out of stuff to do, so there's two tables that we can do that job on, and uh, one table's got a crane, and the other one, well, you've got to lift all the shit up on yourself on your own, um, and it can be fairly fucking heavy shit. So anyway, he's on one and I'm on another and the guy who's supposed to be going to hell, he came over and helped him and then asked that guy who's going to hell, well, he's actually been there for seven years, uh, to help me lift a heavy thing up on the table. And you wouldn't believe it, the guy cracked the shit, this idiot, 
crap the shits that this other guy has been there for years who has helped me for 30 seconds lift something onto a table. And even though he had a crane there, well, he was getting the other guy and himself to lift everything onto the table by hand. And the crane was sitting there doing nothing. Real intelligent. But that's the only job he wanted to do, just work on that table with the stuff that we deal with on that table. And uh, long and short of it is that uh, the guy who's been there for about five months, you know, the guy who he thought he was going to be ordering around at the three-week point, but it was vice versa, ended up uh, doing a bit of stuff, and uh, the two of them had to work together. And, uh, yeah, it uh, turned into a dummy spit, and things were thrown down. Hammer went flying and shit like this, and then uh, <laughs> I heard a good yelling session that went for at least three minutes straight, this yelling. Uh, it was a fair session, and then, uh, of course, the manager got wind of it, and, uh, well, that was it. That was the end of his job. But as you could well expect, the circus didn't end there. So then what happens is this dickhead's gone for, like, I don't know, two weeks or something like that. And he's left all this shit behind because he was sacked, you know, when he got home. He never got to clear all his stuff out. So his radio was still there and, you know, he went to the lunchroom and filled up one of the cupboards full of food like he was fucking moving into the place in about week three, you know. And, of course, most of this food's all still there in the cupboard. And... uh well, he got another job. He's with an agency, and I'm with an agency. And one of these things with these agencies, like, you know, you labor hire, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes in America they call it day hire, but there's a lot of joints that take on people for a year plus under these, you know, and a lot of the, the ones of, well, you know, I mean, let's, fact, let's face it, we're going to be one of those ones that's a year plus before long. But there's some people you get with these temping agencies these labour hire companies, that they are really, honestly, just unemployable. And they bunny hop from one job to the next to the next, but they can do that because it's a temping agent. So they'll be at one place for, you know, a couple of months and things don't work out there, and next place a couple of months and things don't work out there, and next place, next place, next place, you know. For all intents and purposes, they can't hold down a job. But... When they're with the temping agent, they don't really need to because, you know, there will always be another one coming up in the mix. And if not, you know, they just go to another temping agent and off they go again. And uh, I can't say that all people are bad at temping agents because I'm one of them, but <laughs> if you can find people that are, can't hold down a job, you'll find them working at a temping agent and uh, working for a, you know, labour hire company, and, and yeah. So anyway, he got another job with this same labour hire company he was with about two weeks later. Then he decided that uh, he'd ring that agency and say, oh, I'm going to go around getting my food from this place and my radio. Well, we didn't hear anything about it, because these temping agents are chronically hopeless at tying up loose ends. I mean, terrible at getting your paycheck right and all these sort of things. Uh, and I've experienced all that shit. And long and short of it is we didn't hear anything about it and he just friggin' walks in through the side entrance and just starts getting his food and taking out of his car in the car park and all this sort of shit. Didn't come to reception, didn't talk to the manager, nothing. Just fucking walked in and started doing whatever, walking around the place, grabbing his shit, doing whatever. Well, the fucking manager got onto it, and this guy's a South African, and he grew up in the end of the apartheid era, and holy shit, you don't know security issues. If you think Chicago's bad, you ought to have fucking lived in South Africa. They actually have a living area, you know, they've got this huge big rock block wall around the yard usually, and then you've got your living, and a big lock on the door, and your living area is one thing, and then you've got a secondary lock just for all the hallway that leads to the bedroom, so you're safe when you sleep. 
So first of all, they've got to get over a wall with frickin' barbed wire on the top of it, then bust through one lock, and then bust through a second one before they can get to anyone at night, you know. And, uh, you know, when he was 16 years old, he was given a birthday present of a semi-automatic 12-gauge. You know, when he was 17 years old, he got a 9mm pistol. You know, this is the sort of life it was. You know, when he was 14 years old, uh, he saw someone... Uh, well, his sister came in and said, I think there's someone in the backyard. So he just loaded the gun up and put a couple of shots into the ground. The guy ran off. Turned out it was his sister's boyfriend coming around for a bit of... <coughs> late at night, but he didn't sort of, uh, you know, manage to whisper to the sister quick enough before the sister had him go get the gun and... <coughs> into the fucking ground. So I put it like this. At least someone blew their load that night. <laughs> But anyway, you know, this is a sort of life that this guy's, you know, had to live sort of thing. And he sees this idiot walking around. He's very security conscious, this South African. And he sees this idiot walking around there and he, he comes out and he, he, and he goes to him, Get the fuck out of me warehouse! Now, I wouldn't really call the joint a warehouse as such, um, but the boss tends to call it that. Um, it's not a traditional warehouse as most of us know it, but that's what he calls it. And he yells this out to this guy right beside him, and the guy's almost non-responsive. He's like fucking, like a zombie. He just keeps walking straight past him. Absolutely no emotional reaction at all, you know. And then he ended up, his radio had been put in the office sort of thing, and then he Ended up going in there and having a confrontation with the manager and just about had a punch on and one of the other guys I work with dragged him out and got him outside and got him in his car and he's, I need my radio. I need my radio. Well, I can't just go and get it unless the boss says I can get it for you or you can have it sort of thing. You know, you got to ask when you come in. Can't just buy you any. I need my fucking radio. Whoa. He went fucking, you know, berserk. <laughs> over this fucking radio while he's being pushed out of the door and, you know, more or less shoved into his car sort of thing. And uh, and the guy is yelling at goes to him, look at yourself. You're sitting there with a Bible sitting on the passenger seat and you're yelling at me like this. What is going on here? You know, are you, are you a flaming, are you a Christian or not? Like, here you are with the, the Bible sitting on the passenger seat and you're going on at me like you friggin' going berserk and then the dickhead turns around you know the dickhead who's just been kicked out of the fucking joint turns around and says to this guy who's just been yelling at oh oh well can we still be friends oh holy fucking shitballs <laughs> what do you think you know what do you think you fucking idiot so anyway after that the uh, South African guys uh, oh I don't know if one of the office girls one thing there, there was uh, <laughs> something I didn't hear on the on the CB, but apparently it said over the, the two-way system, you know, we're calling the cops or something like this, and one of the office girls must have called the cops for him. So anyway, this guy had gone, and five minutes later or something, the cops turned up and just took a basic report of, of what's going on and everything like that. And this guy, the job that he started he's done his first day there and he's it's been one of these ones where you start real early like 5 a.m or something and he's you know come around to where we are at like you know 1 2 p.m something like that to get his food and his radio and of course all this kerfuffle with the cops and all that they ended up ringing the agency and giving him a brief rundown of what had happened and would you believe it he lost his second job that he only had for one day out of this the teaming agent said, fuck off, we don't want to deal with you anymore. How's that? You go back to your first job to pick up your stuff and cause such a ruckus in the process, cause such a shitstorm, because you wouldn't just go to the office and ask if you can come in and get your stuff. You just barge your way in anyway. And, uh, well... Well, the ruckus he caused, the shitstorm he caused, coming and picking up his stuff from his first job, he lost his second job, which he'd only had for a day. Holy smoke, you know. 
I, I sort of understand why this guy ended up in jail. You know, apparently during his debt collection, he'd force his way into people's houses. While they were right there in the house, he'd push the door in and go and pick up whatever he could get to make up the value of whatever debt was owed. And that's got him in jail the first time round. And, you know, that same mentality hasn't really left him. And just strange, very strange, you know. Boss yelling at him, get the fuck out of me, where? No emotional response, didn't even flinch. There's the guy's right beside him yelling this at him, you know. And then he ends up having a dummy spit in his car at someone and then turns around and says, oh, can we still be friends? After screaming at him fucking 20 seconds beforehand. Fucking unbelievable. I think the cunt's got serious uh, social comprehension issues. Uh, and I start to think that Elvis has much the same thing. You know, and I was sort of thinking as well about what I'd said with the um, making stuff so he could sell it and help himself out. Well, there's plenty of stuff being made in the US and plenty of people are looking for someone to sell their shitty product and become an agent for their $5 piece of crap. He doesn't need me. You could just find any company making any trinket in the United States you know, and sell that, and he'd do well selling, but, uh, yeah, I shouldn't have to really, uh, <laughs> go through all the bullshit of paperwork and customs, not really, nah, but anyway, we'll see where his little fucking train wreck ends, and, yeah.